soon as I see the video message. There we go. Just going to drop the link um, as usual to start for our um, Herrig homepage, which has our, our schedule on it. And um, just to remind people that um, we are here today. <clears throat> we're going through boot camp session three. Um, and then we're just going to carry on with that for the next couple of weeks uh, through sessions four and five. Um, these are really just introducing the R programming language. You know, after the session today, um, people will be able to, to if you're so inclined, go ahead and start using R to do stuff if you want. And I'm happy to use some time in the sessions today. For example, one of the classic questions, it's a, it's a problem you encounter when you start using R to do statistics or making graphs is um, how do I get my data into R? And I will demonstrate that um, when we start the the future sessions that, that cover that explicitly, but I'm happy to use this time today. So we're covering functions today. And um, as I'll explain, we use functions to do everything, including getting your data into R, analyzing it, making plots. So after I go through today's session, you can start to experiment with those things. So I have the, we should have enough time today to look at the, um, the problems together. Maybe maybe do a few together. Maybe set some time aside for that. So um, in the last two weeks of February, I'm away, and I, I can ask people to cover this. And if someone has a burning desire to do so, let me know outside of this meeting uh, if you. If you're really desperate to uh, run a meeting, I'd be fine with that. But we'll we'll take a break from the um, the boot camp for those, and then when I get back from South Africa, we'll continue. And I plan to go on beyond this as well, as long as people are still interested. And uh, so, if you have any feedback about what's useful to you, what you like, the the pace we're going at, just let me know. Happy to do that. Got everything uploaded as usual um, down below here in the meeting topics. You can see a list of all of the meetings from the past, including links to all of the assets, all the slides, um, and links to what we're doing in general. See for some reason that, oh, good. Um, I've just refreshed my screen, and I I thought that I had updated this. And I, I just, when I saw that it wasn't updated, um, I thought that I forgot to do something, but I didn't. So now that it's updated, um, can see that today's meeting is already set up in the slides. If you like to follow along with them, are uh, are ready to go. I'll come back to that in just a moment. I'm just going to click over to the boot camp page, to the functions page that we're going to go through today, and I'll drop the link also in the chat for that. And uh, I'm just going to leave this up because I may come back to refer to it. And uh, of course, we'll be doing a little demonstration in um, in our studio today. OK, the language around um, our studio, it just occurs to me is. Is uh, getting even more complicated because um, as I explained last week, we have R, which is a programming language. But R is also a piece of software. Our software uh, is the programming um, interpretive programming environment for the programming language R. But we use R Studio, the piece of software, to um, mediate between our R code and the R software. And uh, and now that Posit, the company that creates R Studio, has changed its name, we have another level of uh, of terminology in there. OK, but never mind. It's going to go back to our list. I'm going to go ahead and test the link, download my own slides, and just open them up. As usual, if there are any um, proclamations or declarations or questions or anything of that sort, do not hesitate to ask while I um, <clears throat> while I'm talking. Just just feel free to. Um, unmute and um, 
Now, what have I done here? What I wanted to do was I wanted to have this view and I wanted to do that. There we go. And I have my laser pointer. We're on the first slide. I can see the chat and we're ready to begin. So welcome to today. We are going through our run of spring 2024 of the R Stats Bootcamp. We're on session three, which is all about how R functions work, what they are, how to use them, how to find them, how to get help, and how it all works. So my splash page um, is here. I, I've already explained the uh, symbology of the splash page, but um, I think I want to just pause here and remind people if it's your first time. I think I recognize everybody as having been here in the past, but um, if you know anyone who might be interested, feel free to forward this along to them. They can shoot me an email and get involved. So, um, <clears throat> you know, I like a metaphor. And my metaphor for today is that um, it has to do with our functions. What are our functions? Well, we we can think of our functions as uh, something that does work for us, just like a real tool. Um, they they do all the work that we might want to do when we're handling data, analyzing data, making graphs moving data around to organize it like we want it, that's work. And our functions do that work. And so they're a little bit like tools. And uh, you know, where do we store tools? We store tools in a toolbox. And uh, to extend that metaphor, this is one that works really perfectly well for functions uh, in any programming language, is we, we store sets of tools. And usually, just like in regular tools, um, there might be a, a range of tools that are used to complete some single kind of task. Let's say that you're you're building a bird box. You you might need a drill, you might need a saw, and you might need a screwdriver. And um, we might put all of those tools for one task in a toolbox, all ready to go to do the uh, job we, we want to do. And uh, the, the name for that 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 toolbox that has similar kinds of tools in the R world is the package. So our packages um, are are like a toolbox that contain functions that are like tools. It's convenient to think of it like uh, this metaphor. I like this metaphor because. Oftentimes, if we're doing a particular kind of analysis, working with a particular kind of data, want to create a particular kind of graph, we need to pick the right tool for the job. And just like in the real uh, physical world of, of tools, um, we probably could get by with uh, not exactly the right tools, but often it's much easier and better to use the right tool for the right job. So it's exactly like that. Uh, in R. Here's what we're going to cover today. First, I'm going to demonstrate what a function is, how it works, and how you manipulate the little bits of information so that you can start to use it proficiently. Um, well, I'll demonstrate exactly how to use a couple of common functions and, and also how to get help with particular functions. And this just builds on what I mentioned last uh, week about the help function itself. I'm going to show, I'm going to just say a little bit, I'm pontificate a little bit about our packages, these collections of tools, what they are, where they come from, who created them, how you can get them. Uh, I'll just say a little tiny bit about how you can find them. Uh, and then uh, I'll demonstrate how to download and install packages and, and what it means to use an R package that you don't already have with R. So I'll explain all of that and demonstrate it. 
and then the practice exercises, and we should have time for some of them today. Okay, so a function name. We see up here, um, we see this, this, this string that uh, that I've called function name. You know, it's a, just kind of cute by way of introducing this concept. This is the name of some function that we want to use, and then there's an open bracket and a closed bracket, and uh, this part of of that is is literally just the name of the function. But an important thing is that the name of an R function usually has contextual meaning. To get help, we use the help function. To calculate the mean, we use the mean function. To calculate the standard deviation, we use the SD function. So usually we can we can uh, derive context from the the name, and for simple um, functions, we can often guess, and that helps to remember what functions do and which ones we commonly use. If we think about it that way, every function that we use has brackets uh, in the name, and that's an important thing that we'll we'll come on to because what goes in the bracket is um, very important and differs by the kind of of thing that we want to do with our functions. The, um, I noticed that the shading in this template for the um, the um, R code with a back, black background isn't maybe it's too dim, so maybe I'll work on fixing that in the future. We'll have to live with it for now. <clears throat> but uh, what this demonstrates is that for uh, for our function with a function name, um, inside the brackets here and here, I've put a couple of things. So I've called this one argument underscore one and argument underscore two. And uh, these are set with an equal sign. Think of the equal sign as um, <clears throat> in the, if, if we want to use computer jargon, we think of this as a, um, it, it's always also something that does a little bit of work for us. We call it an operator, and this one assigns a value uh, to a variable. So the equal sign here is in, inside okay. functions. Oh, did someone have something to say? Maybe, maybe not. Um, inside of uh, the function brackets, there will typically be a number of arguments that we will have to provide some value to. So, um, you know, these arguments are like are like the settings for the functions, and they they allow us to tailor the work that the function's doing to the work we want done. So one example, an easy example, is that we might have an argument that is the name of the data object. So we would we would provide the value, which is the name of the data object or the data set. If we want to read in our data, one of the arguments we would have to provide is the the name of the file where our data live on our computer. Uh, but there are all sorts of arguments for different kinds of functions, and we'll demonstrate some of them. Every argument inside the function has a unique name within that function. So you can have um, the same name. Let, let's say that there's an argument called data. Uh, the mean um, function might have a data argument, and so might the standard deviation function. Uh, but but the names must be unique within a function. I've already gone over the assignment operator, but also notice these commas out here. So the arguments and their values are separated inside the brackets by commas. Um, so that's another thing to say. And then notice these three dots down here. There's a comma, and then there are three dots. Then has a special meaning. I'm just going to mention what it is because we will encounter it when we look at a at a help page. But what that is there to tell us is that uh, there actually are some additional arguments other than the ones that are explicitly named, but that it is optional 
for us to provide a value explicitly, which probably means that they have some default values. A lot of the time it's safe to just leave them at the default values unless you have a good reason to change them. I will try to remember to give you an example of what I mean by that and when you uh, when it's safe to ignore and when you might want to change it for these optional functions. Okay. So um, mentioned a few of these already. Um, these are different real functions that are in R. So there's the uh, the mean function. Remember, it's it's got the name, like all of these uh, functions. I'll say, and it's got the brackets, like all of these functions. And uh, we've already demonstrated this one last week. It calculates the arithmetic mean. We have the log function. It calculates um, log values for um, for any object. By the way, if we if we wanted to do a math operation, the arguments for these would have to be the data we want to perform that math operation on. Another thing I'll just mention in passing is I hope some of you, when I said this calculates the log, I hope some of you instantly thought in your mind which log you could calculate. Log base 2, log 10, log 2.5. Quite right. The base of the log you can specify, but by default, the log um, function calculates the log base 2. And uh, we can either specify we want log base 10, or there's a special function for log base 10, which is log 10. SD, I've already mentioned that as well, calculates the standard deviation. Plot, what does it do? It draws plots. Matt, what, what your hand is up. Yeah, so what about uh, natural logarithm, Ed? Yeah, natural log uh, LN, I think, is the function, but you can specify okay. an approximation of it in this function if you want. But yeah, this is exactly the kind of detail that the passive aggressive Butler is um, it's very tricky with. So you're thinking along the light, right lines. Yes. Thanks. We can. <clears throat> And then help, and we've already demonstrated that function too. So you get the idea of how this works. All of these functions um, exist, and um, I like to do this uh, this kind of thought experiment. I'll tell you in a few moments about how many uh, packages there are in R that the, that contain functions. But uh, I recently saw a talk. By one of the uh, by a, a, someone who's been around in the R community for a long time, not one of the original creators, not not that fundamental, but uh, they estimated that there were over a million, um, there were over one million R functions uh, available for for download at this time. Aha, okay, so uh, I would have to check the help page myself, and I didn't do it. And uh, I'm glad to be corrected. Thank you. OK, so um, I'm going to do a little demonstration. I'm going to go to the web page first and go down to this part where I have some code. Just for demonstration purposes, I'll, I'll copy the code and talk through it with some live coding, maybe elaborate on it if there's a reason to. Uh, and if not, um, I will. Um, <clears throat> if I don't elaborate, I'll just demonstrate the uh, the code and we can look at it together. But th this is just a workflow that looks at using functions. And um, this is the top of it. And uh, while we're learning to use functions, we have to discover them to be able to use them in the first instance. And there are a whole bunch of, of functions that, um, that we'll use all the time. And uh, one of them is the, the C function, combine or concatenate. Uh, and it just combines um, variables of a, of a single type um, into uh, to a vector. So um, I'm just going to tab over to the bootcamp page and scroll down to say, actually, uh, I've mentioned this before, but um, have a clickable table of contents so you can scroll around um, using uh, using this menu. 
So this is the place that we're at for this. And if you look, there's a there's a bit of script here. And I'm just going to copy that. And I'm going to open my R Studio. I may have to do a little housekeeping in my R Studio. So I get a lot of use every day out of R Studio. I'm just going to close this project. I will change what's loaded up. And I'm just going to close that file and uh, start a new script. And I'm just going to set it up in the normal way that we talked about the last couple of weeks. You can start with a template script if you like. I usually just do this manually. Um, like I said, setting up a, the, the sections in every script is, um, is best practice. Gonna make this a bit bigger so everybody can see better. Who? <clears throat> what? When is the basic data I usually put in this? Ed? R stats bootcamp 03 and here we go. And then I um just go ahead and um, put in a table of contents. You can code along with me if you wish, or you can um, do this later and just watch. Now, I remember I recommend to um, pipe your own code out at least once to learn, to get that muscle memory, to learn what happens when you make a mistake and so forth. I usually put a setup section. And then, you know, some stuff sections, stuff one, stuff two. I wouldn't literally put stuff here. I would make this descriptive of what I'm actually doing. Um, so um, <clears throat> what we're doing is we're going to uh, demonstrate functions. So since we don't really have any setup today, Maybe I'll call this um, a demo functions section. And uh, then I just usually copy that for my first section and put that syntax to make myself this clickable table of contents. Okay. So I'm going to paste this section, copy it again, undo, paste, there we go. Let's have a look make my screen a little bit wider. <clears throat> so um, I've just pasted in this uh, section, demo functions. It's a workflow for using functions. Um, we're, we're going to make pseudocode. So I've already made this pseudocode. If you remember what pseudocode is, it's we're, we're going to do some kind of task. And we break that task down into purely human language uh, each of which is in a small chunk. And so I think I described this um, um, on the web page. So uh, for this one, we've already made our pseudocode for this example. And uh, the overall task is to calculate the mean for a vector of numbers. Okay, we just want to calculate the mean of some numbers. And uh, here is the pseudocode for that task. Okay, so the first thing we need to do is we need to create a vector of data. Now, I um, I will demonstrate a lot of data handling in the future. And remember, the focus of today is just to demonstrate to you that functions do work and the structure of how the code looks for using functions. So if you don't follow exactly everything that's happening, it's OK. Remember, the focus of today is just to understand how functions work. So now this function is, uh, now I'm telling you, this function, it combines data of a similar type into a, what we call a vector. We'll cover vectors in the future, but you can think of a vector today as a street. And uh, along the street are different houses at different addresses. And in every house, for this example, will live a number. Okay, so we're just creating a a, a vector of numbers. And to do that, we use this combined function. Second, we're going to calculate the mean 
um, using the mean function. And then last, we're going to plot that data with the box plot function. Okay, and it's a special kind of plot, the box plot. A lot of there are lots of different plotting functions for different kinds of plots. So we learn them and we learn how to use them. Okay. So step one is just to code our vector with the C function. Now we have two tasks here that you have to think about when you're beginning to learn R. One task is that to do anything, you have to use functions. It does all the work that you'll ever want to do. And uh, but you have an immediate challenge. When you first start to use R, you don't know any of the functions. So you have a sort of a double challenge. You have to learn how to discover what function you need to use, given that you you know what you need to do, what work needs doing. And then you have to understand how to use that function. We're gonna we're gonna forget the first one about discovering what functions exist. Uh, we're going to forget that and um, just assume for now that you know you're going to use the combined function to make a vector, the C function to use a vec make a vector. So the second challenge you have is how do you use that function? I want to encourage you, just like I said last week, to use this help function to get help. And the argument that we put inside of it is uh, the name of the function we want help with. If I just demonstrate. Um, a little shorthand. <clears throat> if I just put my cursor in the help function uh, name and I hit my F1 key, that's a shortcut for bringing up the help menu or the name of a function that your cursor is in. So it's a shortcut for using the help function. So I have brought up the help function page and uh, it looks like the uh, the topic is the name of the argument that we've set C to. Now, um, this code originally it will work without this argument. If I if I remove that and I run this code, line twenty three, for just for fun, I'm going to select what I want to run and I'm going to go up and click the run button. Watch what happens over here in the help window. Three, two, one. So that brings up the uh, the help page for the C function. So it explains it's uh, the C function combines values into a vector uh, or a list. If the variable types are different, it will combine them into a list. If the variable types are the same, it will combine them into a vector. Don't worry about the difference between that now. We'll swing it back around to it. The thing I wanted to show you here on this help page is that we always have at the top of every help page a demonstration of uh, what uh, the code needs to look like in order to use the combined function. In this case, um, the three dots imply that there are some argument names in there, but that we don't have to really worry about um, the values for a lot of them. So we have this thing called recursive, and we have this one called use.names. We scroll down. But uh, the dot, dot, dot here, if we read the description, is for objects to be concatenated. So we can have a lot of them. And in this case, on line 24 of the code, I've put uh, some numbers. Now, in the computer world, we, uh, we need to be accurate about things. The passive aggressive butler is very pedantic, in other words. And uh, we've got some integers. We also have a, a decimal number here. <clears throat> so what we can do is um, I can submit this. And what will happen is uh, it will be repeated down here in the console. So I'm just going to use my hotkey from now on to uh, submit the code. My, my cursor is on this line. I'm going to use control enter. I think command enter if you're in the Mac world. Um, <clears throat> three, two, one. So uh, my command was repeated, and then the um, contents of that vector were printed. Notice how the passive aggressive butler 
has assumed that because we passed one decimal number, that uh, those integers were also decimals. So it's kind of converted that it's taken the liberty, sir, of doing that on the fly. So that, that's an example of something we didn't ask the system to do, which the system has done. We have to usually be kind of careful about that kind of thing, but it's something you you can mostly safely learn over time. If if we wanted to assign this vector to a uh, to a variable, we uh, we talked about the assignment operator. It looks like a little arrow. It's a less than symbol and a minus. And uh, the way we read this is, you know, here's our vector, and we're assigning it or we're putting it into a variable name. Now we could call this variable anything we want. There are some rules. We can't start variable names with a number. They can't contain spaces. They can't contain weird characters like ampersands, things like that. But anything else goes. We could call this Bob. We could call it Zebra. We could call it anything we wanted to, and it would just work. And if I uh, if I go ahead and submit this three two one, it's just repeated my code. And now if I ask R space. Um, if I ask the butler what's actually inside my variable, I'll submit just the variable name. See, I have it selected, three, two, one. Then I get the same answer as uh, just submitting the uh, code that combines the variables. Okay. So um, that's all we need to do to uh, use a couple of variables and make our vector. Second thing, we're going to calculate the mean using the mean function. So um, it's always good practice to look at the help page. We've already looked at the mean help page. Here it is again. And it says uh, to use the mean function, you have to have the argument x. And then there's some other stuff. So uh, under this first usage entry, we would scroll down and say, right, the x is in our object. And it. Uh, we can use it with different kinds of vectors, it goes on to say, um, <clears throat> that are numerical and logical. And we can also use them with a few other specialty ones to do with time. OK, so um, so one way to use the, uh, the mean vector is to take our x argument and assign it to our vector. And if I um, go ahead and submit this, 3, 2, 1, we we get the mean out of it. By the way, because we uh, we also have this variable that I called my var. I've I've got my screen kind of big, but um, up here, if I just make it visible a little bit in our our environment, our global environment, in memory, we we have that um, vector that we made with the variable object name, my underscore var. So we could also just calculate the mean using that. This would this would be a more typical way of doing it. Three, two, one. Of course, we get the same answer. Um, note the level of accuracy. This is something you can set. If you, if you don't need accuracy, six is the default. Six decimal points is the default to display. But variables are actually contained at a at a higher decimal accuracy. Um, this is just the default for the display, and you can set those global parameters. But um, I just wanted to mention that in passing. And then last, um, we need to plot our our data with a box plot. That was our third task. So again, we're going to bring up the help page for box plot three, two, one. And uh, look at this. The box plot also has a argument called X, which is the only one that's required. And if we scroll down, um, we actually don't see X show up here. This is an exception. Oh, it's down here. OK. So uh, this is just the data that you um, are going to plot in your box plot. So again, here I've explicitly put that same vector, but maybe I'll just um, Box plot my var. Now uh, the argument is 
is x. And we use the equal operator to set the argument x in the boxplot function to our variable. But down here, I haven't typed x equal. And up here, I didn't type x equal. And what's happening here is that for some variables, now this, this is a point of confusion when we're beginning to use R sometimes. Um, if you don't specify the argument, here in this case, there's only one, there's only one um, default argument. And if we do not specify the argument, uh, the, the passive aggressive butler of R assumes, of course, you mean to put this into the argument that's the single default. So it, it takes and guesses what we want, even though we've used the shorthand. And in our syntax, and with a lot of computing languages, <clears throat> there are guides to style so that there's consistency between different people who are coding. And uh, this syntax where there's, um, there's an, an implied default argument, um, it's, in, it's fine not to specify the argument name according to our style. So this is something you'll commonly see if there's just a default argument. It's meant to be friendly to beginners, so let's just do it. The, now the plots tab is over here and it will automatically come to the front when we uh, do this. So you can keep your eyes over here where the plot will appear, three, two, one. And there it is. <clears throat> So it's uh, got the range approximately on the y-axis, no label on the y-axis, it's no label on the x-axis, and it's got a box plot. We'll cover this in the future, but this is a, a kind of plot that um, has a lot of statistical information built into. It's called a box plot, not because it's shaped like a box, but it's named after the, the famous lovely statistician named George Box, who humbly named it after himself. It's the way I like to say it. And there's meaning built into the uh, graphic. The, um, the uh, hinges of the box, which are the sort of jargon term that George Box called these boundaries, are the 50% quartiles of the data. And that means that 50% of the values fall within the range of the box hinges. The black line, is not the mean, but it's the median. So uh, the degree to which the median is uh, different to the mean in any data is the degree to which your data might be skewed. And the whiskers out here on the box plot are the range of your data, unless there are outliers, in which case it's the 95% confidence interval. So even though this is a deceptively simple plot, there's a lot going on, which we'll discuss later. But do you see how easy it is to make a plot like that? I'm not going to bother putting uh, labels or anything because we'll talk all about that later. But um, I do have this challenge that asks um, add an axis label to the y axis. Can you find the name of the argument? So that implies that there is an argument. We will allow you to do that. And uh, my challenge is with a little hint to um, look on the help page. OK. Say a little bit about our packages. I say that um, in this first bullet point that they're extremely useful, but it really is an understatement. I Not only are they extremely useful, but they, they are mandatory, really, to use R to do almost anything. So to give you an idea of this, um, this extends my metaphor one more time of the if functions or tools, and if uh, packages are, are toolboxes that contain a lot of functions, then um, R is kind of like a garage, and uh, in the garage are different toolboxes. And maybe you are the kind of person that uh, has the need to work on your car. 
and then maybe another time you need to um, paint your bedroom and maybe another time you'll need to um, fix the <clears throat> fix the chain on your bicycle for all of those things you might need different tools they're stored in different toolboxes and um, by default the the default packages in R um, there are about uh, 200 that come with base R without downloading anything. These have things like the uh, help function, the mean, the standard deviation, the C function, all those ones, the log function, a lot of basic mathematical functions, a lot of basic statistics functions, linear regression, correlation, that sort of thing, simple linear regression. Um, but, but actually, the reason R is so popular is that um, there are lots more packages that you you would download when and and if you need them. And at the moment, there are over twenty thousand. And now I haven't checked. So I don't know if anybody is quick and so inclined. You can go to a CRAN and Google around and maybe find out how many there are at this point in time. The last time I checked, there were about twenty thousand. But it's been a year or two since I've checked. The amazing thing about this is that um, they're completely community made. They're made by statisticians, um, applied scientists, people that take the open source base of R and are so inclined to create their own tools and are further so inclined to immediately share those tools. There's a quality control system in place to make sure they work and doing what they say they're gonna do and that they're safe. Uh, and it's just astonishing that there are so many of them all doing different things, sometimes radically different things. Everything from, um, you know, the bioconductor project that does bioinformatics analysis to the LME4 um, package that does mixed effects models to the VizReg package that makes specialty uh, uh, graphics to do with uh, statistical models. And, and, you know, uh, over 19,000 more. Now, um, the challenge here is that, well, one thing I'll say before I go on to the challenge is that um, wh why don't, I said you had to download these packages. You know, you, to get them, you have to download them. Why, if it's all so good, do you have to download this stuff? And the, the simple reason is that the R, um, the R toolbox of the base 200 packages are very small in size. You know, if you download SPSS these days, um, you're gonna be pushing a gigabyte of stuff. That may not mean much to some of you, but that's a pretty big, that's a pretty big piece of software. And many of the tools in SPSS you'll never use. You know, most people will never use most of the tools that are by default in it. Or Genstat is the same way. I don't know how big it is these days, but it'll be pretty big and you won't use most of the tools in there. The 200 are core tools that you use a lot. And these 20,000 are tools that um, mo most people will never use. And so they're not all by default included in the download because it's unnecessarily large. And, and R, therefore, can be made tiny um, by comparison, much more efficient. By tiny, what do I mean by tiny? Tiny these days means about 100 megabytes or so, a little bit bigger than that um, when it's installed. So much, much smaller than it would otherwise be. Um, now, I mentioned that they're community made. Every version of R, R new versions of R come out about quarterly. Or so maybe maybe three times a year and uh, every package that's officially in the the official repository i think i mentioned that the official repository is called cran it's the comprehensive r archive network um, every single one every update of r must be recompiled so they have to be constantly maintained now the challenge there are two challenges principally one is that to, to use these packages, you have to know they exist. You have to know that you need them. You know, you have to have a problem to solve 
and you have to discover them. How do you discover packages? Well, there are two ways. One way is to um, discover a demonstration of a solution to a problem you have, and then to pay attention to the tools that are being used to solve that problem, or, or to take advice from somebody about um, what package you could use. But, but most people would, would resort to, uh, to Google. It is actually quite hard to discover packages through just the R network. So you do need to know the name of the package before you can even install it. <clears throat> so we usually discover this in, in scientific articles, uh, word of mouth, tutorials, forum postings via Google. Second challenge, this is an easier challenge most of the time, so you have to learn to use the packages uh, and their functions. And there are special ways to do that. Um, there's a special kind of documentation called a vignette. Um, I don't know if there are any French speakers in the, um, to, to explain the, vi the etymology of vignette to us, but uh, I think it's like a little story that, that demonstrates it. It usually is a small tutorial with some examples, um, the vignettes. Not every package has a vignette, but that's what they're for. Okay, so um, how do you get at these packages? I'm gonna show you two ways to install packages. Uh, we're gonna forget the part about um, how to discover them for now. For now, uh, if you'll allow it, and for the next few weeks, uh, I'll just suggest packages that you may want to use. But if you have a problem and you want to talk about how to find it, by all means, bring it to one of the sessions or or just uh, tell us that you have a problem and we'll take a break and we'll we'll discuss some of the potential packages that you could use to solve that that problem. But for now, we're going to talk about installing a package. There, there are principally two ways. One way is to install it with code. And um, to do that way, we uh, will use the install.packages function. This is the way that, that I like to install packages. It's the way I've done it for a long time. You have to type it a little bit, but you know it's fast to type it if you're in the habit of typing it. Um, and you can control exactly what you install that way. Uh, and you install it by, by specifying the package uh, the PKGS argument, setting it to the name of the package you want to install. And, um, you know, this is just a, a placeholder for a real package name, but notice it's in double quotes. So the kind of data that this package's argument needs is a character string. So we have to put that in double quotes. We haven't really talked about variable types, but that's what the quotes mean. For now, if you can just accept that, just going to tab over to the um, to the page again, and uh, this is now we're up to section four, finding and downloading packages. <clears throat> so um, I'm just going to um, copy this code, go back to our to our R page, paste it in. Um, <clears throat> I really want to keep my code up to date, <clears throat> might add that to the contents. So, um, and I can just go and go down to the new start. It looks a little bit awkward because I've got my text so big, but um, this kind of system, we only have 50 lines or so of this script. And if, when we start getting to about this, this amount of code, amount of lines, becomes really useful. So you'll use it all the time if you start using it. So if we bring up the help page, um, I'll just do that. Three, two, one. We see an account just like we expect of the um, packages command. And um, if we scroll down a little bit about what it means, I'm just going to make this a bit smaller so it doesn't look so bad uh, to me. But um, it it talks about um, some differences between Windows and 
Unix machines. I think that um, Macs may function as Unix alikes on this. So if you're interested in some of that, you can uh, pay attention to it. But we can ignore some of the technical details for now. We're, we're just going to install something uh, simple. Um, this is how it works, as I had on the slide. And uh, this is then um, how you load a package. OK, so let me explain this. <clears throat> when we are um, when we are uh, acquiring a package and downloading it, it's a little bit like uh, you're in your garage and that toolbox is not in your garage. And downloading it is a little bit like going and getting it and putting the toolbox in your garage. OK, that's the first step. But we can't use any of the tools, even though you've downloaded it and the, the toolbox is in your garage. We can't use any of the tools until we open the toolbox. And uh, otherwise, the, the tools are in storage until we open the toolbox and kind of lay them out for use. And uh, that's where this package um, utility comes in. Now, this is a bit of a confusing thing. This is just one of those things you have to commit to memory. To open the toolbox, we have to use the library function. And we use it on the package name that we downloaded. So uh, it's a little bit like in installing the packages, um, downloads the toolbox, puts the toolbox in your garage, using the library function, opens the toolbox and lays the tools out. And that's a little bit like what it is. And then there's a challenge here. We just do this together. Just making the uh, comments wrap around so that we can read them all in the um, same page. So the challenge is to uh, install and load the ggplot2 package, then use help to look at the help page for ggplot and okay, ggplot function in the ggplot2 package. So uh, what kind of R object is required by the data argument? This is what we've asked for the challenge. So the way we do this, we could write out pseudocode to do this, but I'm just going to do it kind of quickly given the time. And I'm going to say uh, install packages ggplot2. Remember, that has to be in double quotes. So um, if you look down here in the console window, you'll see some stuff happening when I run this. Three, two, one. So a lot of stuff is um, going by. We can see it's thinking because there was a, uh, a little stop sign over here. If we just kind of have a little peek at what is happening, it says, uh, well, warning, we need something. As long as it's warning, we can usually ignore it especially in the early days of starting R. Um, and it says um, it says that it actually failed to download because um, I don't have the uh, a new version of a maybe spelling. Let's have a look. Did I spell it incorrectly? ggplot2. OK, so thanks. Spelling. Correct. Let's try it. I thought maybe I had an older version of R and they've just come out with a new version. There we go. Now I'm glad you're in the chat. You're really you got my back today, Tim. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> so um, what has happened is uh, successful when it was spelled correctly. The uh, the package was downloaded. It says that 4.1 megabytes was downloaded, and it says it was successfully unpacked from its uh, its compiled zipped version. That we can just kind of ignore what that means. It just automatically uh, has been compiled for us already. And then the second thing we want to do is just load up the library. Uh, now, I believe that I specified in the page that we needed this in double quotes. I'm not sure it does, but uh, let's do it anyway, like I've specified on the page. Three, two, one. <clears throat> And I get a little bit of a warning here. It says that it was built under our version 4.3.2. Let's just see what version I'm on. So I thought I um, had downloaded and installed, but I'm on 4.3.1. And I'm just going to go up to my uh, 
my tools, my options here. And uh, so I haven't updated to the latest version of R on this computer. I think I must have done that on my home computer. Okay, but that's okay. So we've uh, we've gotten a warning message only, and in this case, it's okay to ignore that warning message. So um, now that um, we've loaded the ggplot2 package, one of the functions in the package is a ggplot, and I wanted to leave my cursor exactly like I just did because we noticed this pop-up. I haven't pointed this out before, but um, this is a tool tip, and our studio is really good at it. Sometimes the tool tips annoy me because they pop up a lot of stuff, but every every function name, if I just back up a little bit, let me back up, let me do this again, ggplot. So every function name that begins with what I started typing will pop up here. So uh, we have, we have quite a lot of options, but the one we want is ggplot. So if I just submit that, uh, what we see is that we have just like we expect, we have um, a couple of the default arguments, including the data argument. And uh, the last task was what kind of R object uh, is required by the data argument in the function ggplot. And it's it's just a default data set, a data object. So this is again just showing through several examples doing the same thing as a as a standard practice while we're getting on top of R. I thought we had plenty of time, but we're almost out of time. So I'm just going to finish my last couple of slides, have a quick peek at the um, at the um, exercises. And I'm going to have to leave quite quickly today. I have a, actually a meeting at, at five minutes after five, so I just have a couple of minutes. So um, I wanted to show quickly this alternative way through the graphical user interface of installing packages. So this you can follow along on the website if you want. I'll just demonstrate it uh, real briefly. Over here in this part of uh, the RStudio interface, there's a Packages tab, and if we just click on it, <clears throat> there are a number of buttons and there's a graphical display of all the packages that we've downloaded. And you can see, yeah, I've got a bunch of them all downloaded. So this is in my local library, already downloaded ones. And um, I can, to load them as opposed to using the library function, I can just click one of these buttons here and we can see some stuff happened over here in the console and it, it loaded up that package for me. So by clicking this, it generated the lo library loading code for me. But there's also the install button. And uh, if I wanted to install a package, I'm gonna just pick one that I that I like and use sometimes it's called PWR, it calculates statistical power. Um, and there's a checkbox here install dependencies. Um, it asks where I want to install it from. Now, um, you can download uh, packages that aren't in CRAN from, say, a place like GitHub or from a friend or something like that. Almost all the time, especially when you're beginning, you will never change this. It's always going to be CRAN. Uh, and if you know what you're doing, you can install from a zip. Um, and then down here, you can specify where you want the local library to live. And usually, most people would keep the default. Uh, so let's just hit install. The dependencies part of that um, was, was uh, sometimes there are packages that um, require other packages in order to function properly. And uh, that's what that dependency was. If there are some, by default, it will also download those. That's usually what you want. So now we could either scroll down to the um, PWR. Um, 
and it should be listed here now. And see if it is, if it's behaving. So there it is. Uh, and we can just load it either by clicking the button or by by just loading it that way. <clears throat> Have the option of um, putting the name of the of the package when you're loading it with library, either in quotes, it works fine without quotes as well. But for install packages, it requires the quotes. And our style for consistency, uh, want, you know, it, it recommends using the quotes for both of these functions when you're specifying a package name. And then that's it, the practice exercises. I'm just going to quickly go here to the practice exercises and I really strongly encourage you to try these package um, practice exercises for the for the functions and for every page, and uh, maybe also to to go and type the code yourself. You can do that between the times in this week, and uh, if you do run into snags, I'll endeavor to keep my eye on on the uh, Slack channel. But you could also just drop questions in the this very team's channel, which persists. So um, any comments or questions, because that's all I've got. I'm going to stop the video here and I'm going to have to scuttle on to a, a cheeky late me afternoon meeting. <laughs>